Discord engineers recently revealed how they store and work with trillions of messages. And what they had to go through is actually pretty crazy. To put that into context, a trillion is a million million. It actually has 12 zeros and is a million times more than Excel actually has rows available. You can also take 5 trillion and come close to the current holdings of the United States. But back to topic now. If you don't know yet, Discord is a messaging app. But unlike Slack or Microsoft Teams, which are built for boring work life, Discord was originally built for gamers and is now used by communities around the world. Nowadays, Discord has over 150 million monthly active users and something close to 19 million monthly active servers. That requires some decent choices for databases, infrastructure, or technologies in general. Originally, Discord even used MongoDB in the beginning, but switched over to Cassandra later. Cassandra is a NoSQL database implemented in Java. Yeah, the same Java that is used in enterprises around the world with second long stop the world garbage collector pauses and even more fun. At the beginning of 2022, Discord's Cassandra cluster storing messages had around 177 nodes that all frequently caused a lot of trouble. Technically, the engineers of Discord used a relatively clever technique to partition messages within a cluster. If you look at the statement, you will see that it creates a table within Cassandra and assigns a primary key to it. That also partially defines the partitioning. Messages are partitioned by the channel and a bucket that's a static time window. This means that all messages belonging to the same channel are basically stored and replicated together. On one hand, it's easier to fetch a few messages that you have missed since you were last active. On the other hand, large servers with many users tend to put quite some stress on just a few Cassandra nodes. And that's exactly the issue Discord engineers ran into. For Cassandra, reads are more expensive than writes. Writes can be appended to a commit log that is eventually written to the disk at some point. Reads, however, often have to get data from the disk and that is usually way slower than looking up things in memory. Whenever many users tried to read the latest messages in the channel, the corresponding Cassandra nodes had to do a lot of file system I.O. to get that data. The more users there were, the hotter a petition became, and the more it fell behind, as it couldn't keep up with serving all these queries. Additionally, Discord also used quorum consistency for its Cassandra cluster, which was basically a technique to agree on the status quo in an eventually consistent system. A certain number of nodes need to agree on the certain state of the data for it to be accepted as the truth. And this means that several nodes need to perform the same operation and respond with their state of the data. I think you get the point by now. Not only one node needs to perform a lot of I.O. and then falls behind, several do. As if things were not already bad enough, the engineers also had to frequently deal with issues regarding Cassandra compacting data on disk and the JVM garbage collector. This basically brought the engineers three issues to deal with at the same time. First, a node group having to keep up with a lot of reads, which resulted in increased latency. Second, a node group trying to additionally compact its on disk data, which caused even more trouble and latency. And third, the JVM garbage collector trying to free up memory, leading to long stop the world pauses. Sometimes the engineers even had to take nodes out of rotation to let them do their compaction before they could be brought back in. Just try to imagine how fun your encore would be if you had to do all that all while trying to keep the rest of the platform up and running as well. The engineers at Discord somehow had to tackle the problems they had and in the end they came up with a three-step plan. Step one, replace Cassandra. The first and probably obvious solution was to replace Cassandra. Gladly, there is a database that is fully compatible with Cassandra and also has some improvements over its ancestor, ScyllaDB. Unlike Cassandra, ScyllaDB is implemented in C++ and doesn't suffer from garbage collector issues because in C++ you manage memory manually or at least semi-automatically. Other engineers at Discord had also experienced the same issues with Cassandra and had thus already begun migrating their own Cassandra clusters over to ScyllaDB after testing for a longer time. The messages team thus began conducting their own tests with ScyllaDB. But next to that, they still had two issues to tackle. First, a node group having to keep up with a lot of read. And second, a node group additionally trying to compact its on disk data. The issue of hot partitions thus still wasn't solved. ScyllaDB removes the need to worry about a garbage collector running in the background, but it doesn't magically work better under load, as it still employs the same strategies as Cassandra to provide its storage services. And this led to step two of the migration, reduce the load on the database cluster. 
it's probably a good idea to take a look at the simplified diagram of the architecture of the Discord API before we continue. In front of everything sits Discord's REST API monolith that is, by the way, implemented in Python. This API does not serve all traffic like voice channels, but it's definitely responsible for the delivery of messages from the channel. Interestingly, the API had direct access to the messages database cluster without any intermediary service. That's an interesting architectural decision. To reduce the load on a cluster, the engineers implemented intermediary services. They simply call data services. A data service is a relatively simple service with the following traits. It is implemented in Rust. It contains no business logic. It has roughly one gRPC endpoint per query and it decouples incoming requests. What this basically means is the following. Whenever a user requests one or multiple messages from a channel, a worker task is spun up that executes that query. If more requests come in during the time asking for the same data, they subscribe to the already existing task instead of spinning up their own. Whenever a worker task finishes, it distributes the data it fetched from the database to all subscribers. That's a pretty simple but effective way to reduce the load on the database cluster significantly. The larger a Discord server becomes, the more effective this technique becomes for this particular server. The only issue with this technique that still had to be solved was the following though. Services of large-scale systems nowadays usually don't run as singleton instances. There are usually multiple instances of a single service running. Between individual different services, there are usually some kind of load balances deployed that take care of distributing traffic to individual instances of a single service. In a worst case scenario, every request basically asking for the same data could be delivered to a completely different instance of a data service, which would then completely undermine the original idea. So how do you solve this? Well, you make sure that routing becomes consistent, which means that requests that belong together, stay together and arrive at the same instance of the data service. Discord's engineers solve this by implementing consistent hash-based routing. Consistent hash-based routing is a topic for a video in itself, but for now, you should only know this. This technique ensures that no matter how many instances of a data service there are, you're always able to derive a target instance from an input. In this particular case, the channel ID is the input and the target instance of a data service is the output. This way, the API monolith makes sure to always deliver requests to the data service instance they belong to. I became a little curious after I read about these data services and asked myself whether I could implement something like this myself. And this is the reason why we are now jumping into some code. What we have here is a relatively simple Rust service. It uses Tonic for gRPC and has one endpoint for now. And that only RPC method the service provides is relatively simple. It just uses a query handler that implements the actual logic, processes the result and then returns something to the clients. The query handler, however, is where things become more interesting. Internally, it uses something I'd call a weight map, which is just a fancy type alias over an arc mutex over a hash map with a string key and a broadcast channel as its value. For this example, we go with the easiest query imaginable, fetching all messages from a specific channel. Whenever a request comes in, we lock the weight map so we can begin to do our actual logic. Then we can see whether we already have an entry in this weight map. If not, such a request is currently not processed, which means that we need to start it. That's the none case. We open a broadcast channel that subsequent requests can later subscribe to, to receive the singleton result we are going to fetch in a moment. Next, we add the channel ID as a key to the wait map, so all subsequent requests will lead to a subscription and not another query. Then we do a pretty simplified SQL query here. Please keep in mind that this is not optimized. It's no prepared statement or anything like that. In production code, you should probably do it differently and optimize a little more because simple queries are not the most performant for SillaDB, for example. For this demonstration, however, it should suffice to show you how you can achieve something similar. We then send the query and process the result. After that, we trigger the send function. This call leads to the following things. First, the key is removed from the wait map again. Second, the reply is sent to the broadcast channel so all subscribers can pick it up. After that, we simply return the result to the request that triggered the worker task in the first place. In the sum case, which means that a task is already spun up, we only need to subscribe to the broadcast channel we have placed inside the wait map earlier. We then return that and are already done. The rest of the logic is hidden within the query result struct. 
Within that result is an enum nested. And that enum can have two possible values. First, a receiver. Second, a value. In the end, this enum only exists to provide a consistent access method called get, which users of the API can use to retrieve a value. In case of a receiver, the function call waits for the nested receiver of the broadcast channel to provide the value after the query has finished running in the background. In case of a value, the actual query result is directly nested within the enum member, and we don't need to perform any more logic except returning it directly. And that's it for a relatively simple implementation of such a data service. Now that we have taken a look at the possible implementation, we can focus on the last step of the migration. Step three, perform the actual migration. The first thing the engineers had to do was to provision a new SillaDB cluster. And that was definitely the easiest part of the migration. As a first try, the goal was to do a write data both to Cassandra and Scylla. So instead of writing data only to Cassandra, the data would also be written to SillaDB at the same time. After that, the historical data up to a specific point needed to be migrated in parallel. For the first try, the team decided to go with SillaDB's data migrator, which uses Apache Spark under the hood. And that sadly didn't work out too well. An estimation showed that the process would have taken three months, which is a pretty long time. And the longer such a migration usually takes, the more risky it usually becomes. And no one likes waiting for two months and 29 days only to find out that something fails on day 30 or 31. As the team already had some experience using Rust, Hello Data Services, they decided to rewrite the migrator in Rust and do some magic themselves. What they created is basically a small program in Rust that reads data from the Cassandra cluster, stores it in the SQLite database temporarily, and then pushes that data over to the Scylla cluster. Interestingly, this approach resulted in an estimated migration time of only nine days, which is incredible given the fact that this cluster basically contained trillions of messages. In the end, there are only minor issues left. At 99.9999%, the migration actually stopped because there were some gigantic data blocks left that Cassandra had never actually compacted. But this could be solved easily by manually starting the process to compact that leftover data blocks. After that, the team only had to do a few more tests to verify that the migration had been successful and then let the two clusters run in parallel for some time. Sometime later, they finally switched over traffic to Scylla completely. And that put a happy end to the migration. Performing such a migration is definitely no easy task. But given how the engineers at Discord handled this, it's pretty interesting to see which strategies they actually employed to get this done. Especially the fact that Discord had to switch over from Cassandra to Scylla shows that database choices are usually not for eternity. You can only work with what you know now and from time to time, you really have to switch technologies under the hood. Caching is not always a solution, but data services and decoupling requests might be a great choice to actually reduce costs on your database or even make your system more resilient. But that's it for this video now. If you enjoyed watching this video, consider dropping a like and subscribe to this channel because it helps massively. And until then, see you in the next video.